But even as a kid, I would notice bales of straw or bales of hay that would get tossed against the barn if they had a broken string or whatever, and they'd get rained on, and they would begin that decomposition process. And six months or a year later, the biggest, tallest, healthiest, greenest weeds on the whole farm were the thistles that grew out of those decomposing bales. And then I would use a pitchfork. Of course, when dad drove the manure spreader past, I, it was my job to toss them on the manure spreader. And I would notice that the inside was just this beautiful, crumbly, just absolutely gorgeous media, you know, almost like soil that it had broken down into. The covering that I put over my beds every year is compost. Because as I said, I'm also interested in sustainability. Mm. You know, so even even if you, you grow organically and you buy organic fertilizers, you know, these are grown somewhere and they have to be hauled. And, uh, you know, there's a certain environmental cost for that. So I try and not try to. I do make all my own compost and I uh, put an inch depth over all the beds once a year. And this provides everything besides smothering weeds. It provides everything uh, the, the plants need for intensive growing one year. Hi, John Morgan here with the Keep Growing podcast. We've mentioned compost quite a bit this season. And I think it's time we take a deeper look at the fundamentals of composting. You see, composting is one of those key skills that I think all new gardeners should add to their tool belt. And what also got me thinking about composting is this last week I went to Cultivate, which is kind of a huge industry trade show and conference uh, that takes place each year in Columbus, Ohio. It has usually around 10,000 people in attendance from literally all over the world. One of the things that I did this year is I went on a tour of Scott's miracle Grows Research and Development Division at their headquarters in Marysville, Ohio. And their headquarters, it is huge. The campus itself covers about 720 acres. And this tour showed off their new line of products called Performance Organics. Part of that featured their own line of compost. So on the tour, Dr. Tara Lewandowski, senior scientist of garden technology development, outlined the benefits of compost. So let me run down the list that she provided. Let me grab the paper here. <laughs> compost, it has a number of benefits. It improves soil structure and porosity creating a better plant root environment. It increases infiltration and permeability of heavy soils. It improves water holding capacity, reducing water loss and leaching in sandy soils. It supplies a variety of macro and micronutrients. And it may control or help suppress certain soil-borne plant pathogens. And it supplies significant quantities of organic matter and it improves cation exchange capacity CEC of soils and growing media thus improving their ability to hold nutrients for plant use and it supplies beneficial microorganisms to soils and growing media and improves and stabilizes soil pH so that's kind of a very sciencey list of things but basically, compost, it's like magic when it comes to soil. It has all of these qualities that are terrific for soil. You know, you can add just regular old fertilizer, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, run-of-the-mill, your standard chemical-based fertilizers. Then there's also organic fertilizers, which they also talked about on this tour because they're developing their own line of organic fertilizers now. But compost kind of goes a step further. It's, it's kind of like uh, fertilizer on steroids. And it's also long-acting because it's a product that's broken down and decomposed. But it's also still going through that process even after it's been added to soil. So you get this time-release effect with compost. Another thing that they showed off on the tour is 
the process that they go through to actually test and verify the quality of their compost because they have multiple locations around the U.S. that are producing compost and they want it all to fall within a certain standard range. And I'm not sure if I could legally, you know, go into a lot more detail uh, about that because on the tour, you know, it is their research and development department. So they were (laughs) on the tour. I was like, "Uh, you can take a picture of this but not this over here. So if you want to see a little bit more of the tour and some of the stuff that I was allowed to take pictures and video of, later this week, I'm going to be uploading a vlog that I did of my view of Cultivate and what I experienced. I'm going to be uploading that to YouTube a little bit later this week. I've still got some editing to do on the video. Uh, But yeah. Scott's miracle Grow, that facility is really awesome. And hopefully in the future, I'll get somebody here on the podcast from Scott's to, to talk about what they're doing up there in Ohio. Um, so what is compost? And more importantly, how can we make our own? I'm sure you can go out and buy it, but compost is actually really easy to make. I've said before that compost is magic. Of course, it's a little bit more than that. But really, all that it is is decomposed organic matter. It gets even simpler than that because there's really only four ingredients to compost. There's greens, browns, moisture, air. And then I like to say that there's a fifth ingredient, and that's time. Because it does take time to, I don't know if you're really growing, but producing compost. So let's take a look at, of course, air and moisture. We know what they are. Um, So let's take a look at greens and browns. Greens are anything that's high in nitrogen content. So that's things like vegetable scraps uh, from your kitchen, uh, grass clippings, and then garden weeds. But... With one caveat, you want to make sure that if you put weeds from your garden into your compost bin, that they don't have seeds on them. And then also there's some greens that aren't green, but they're still called a green because they're high in nitrogen. And that's things like coffee grounds and manure. And since we're talking about those and they're brown, let's get to, in the case of compost, browns. So browns, when it comes to composting, are anything that's high in carbon. So that's dry leaves. Uh, Sawdust is great to compost. So uh, I know in this area where it's a more rural area, a lot of people, if they have horses, they'll use sawdust in the stalls. That is great to add into compost because it's got a little bit of horse manure in it, also some urine. And that adds nitrogen in. Um, Then there's also straw. So Joel with the uh, straw bell gardening, he's basically starting off with a big clump of browns. And then he's getting the nitrogen in by adding nitrogen fertilizer to the bale to kind of start the composting process. Then there's also cardboard and paper. You can compost cardboard and paper. The only thing is, is with those... You know, if you're composting cardboard, you want to make sure that it doesn't have tape or anything like that on it, or staples. And with paper, you want to make sure that if it has ink on it, that it's a uh, an organic-based ink. Like, I know a lot of newspapers now, they actually use a soy-based ink uh, to print with. So those, you can compost. There are some things that you want to avoid, and that's anything like meat or dairy or anything that's oily or greasy from your kitchen. And then, like I said before, you want to avoid weed seeds. And then also any plants with diseases. Because uh, we'll talk here in a little bit about temperature and composting. Um, If you're doing compost right, the pile's going to get really warm. And something that they talked about on the Scott's miracle Grow tour is that they have like a set temperature range and a set time period that they want to get that compost up to. And that's to kill off any seeds 
or diseases or anything like that in the compost. And, you know, they're doing that on an industrial scale. And the larger the pile, the easier it is to get it up to that temperature. So when it comes to the process of making compost, the first thing is bin shape and size and stuff. And there's all types of composting systems out there. Uh, but the easiest thing that I've found is using pallets to make compost bins. I use a system where I use three pallets to kind of make a U-shape. And that leaves one side open, which makes it easy for me to get in and turn the compost. Uh, some people use four-sided bins. And that just makes it a little bit harder to get down in it and really stir it up. If you do use pallets like I use, uh, make sure that you get untreated pallets because you don't want to be introducing any, you know, chemicals into your compost. And I find that with using untreated pallets, they usually last about four or five years before they really start to rot and fall apart. And, you know, once they do that, they're pretty easy to dispose of. Uh, you just want to make sure you get all the nails out. The next thing to watch out for when it comes to compost is kind of the recipe for compost. And it's a really simple recipe. Um, you want to do mostly browns and then a little bit of greens. Usually, you kind of run into this problem where you have more greens than you do browns. Um, but you want to avoid putting in a ton of of greens because you'll end up with a, a compost that's too wet and it's kind of slimy and if it starts to smell bad then you know that you're kind of doing something wrong but generally you want to do 25 parts browns to one part of greens and something that you can also do to kind of help introduce uh, microbes and bacteria into your compost is kind of inoculate it with a little bit of soil from your garden. Uh, that really helps kind of jumpstart it and get it going. Once you get that mix in and you get it mixed up really well, if it's too dry to get moisture into it, you just add some water, you know, with watering can or watering hose. On the flip side, if it gets too wet and it's kind of slimy and looks kind of mushy and it's too wet, the easiest way to fix that is add in some dry browns and then also give it a stir. You know, get in with a pitchfork and turn it over and that really helps air get in because that's your other ingredient is air. And you really need to get air in there to help feed that bacteria because what we're going for here is an aerobic process. If you don't get enough air, it'll kill off the aerobic bacteria, and then the pile will go anaerobic on you, and then you're actually producing toxins that can harm plants later on down the road. You always want to make sure that you have good airflow around your pile. What will happen is, is that bacteria, as it's growing and dividing, it actually generates heat. If you watch bacteria divide under a microscope, it's kind of cool to watch because cellular mitosis kind of takes effect and the bacteria kind of elongates and then it splits into two bacteria. And when they do that, they kind of vibrate. And as they're doing that, they're generating tons of heat. That's usually the limiting factor when it comes to making your own compost at home. Because usually you don't have a big enough pile to generate the heat that you need to really kill off the weed seeds. And that's why I say that you want to avoid putting any, uh, any weeds with seeds on a, into your pile. But on an industrial scale, compost piles like these big huge compost piles like that cities produce or companies like Scott's miracle Grow, those compost piles can get up around 150 degrees Fahrenheit, so get pretty toasty. But you know, at home, where you've got a smaller pile, it's probably not going to get that hot. It might get warm, and you know, in the fall and winter time, you might see it steaming. But the problem with that is, is it's just going to take a longer amount of time to arrive at compost. You're, you're going to get beautiful black compost no matter what, but the temperature really affects the time. So the warmer it is, the faster the compost will form. The cooler it is, the longer it's going to take. But still, you know, you're going to get compost. So once you have compost, 
uh, what are some uses for it? Well, first of all, you can use it as a soil amendment. You can mix compost in with your regular garden soil, and it'll have all those benefits that I listed before. And um, you can also use it as a top dressing. So at the end of the year, at the end of you know the gardening season, once you clear out your garden bed, you can add like an inch thick layer of compost to the top of it through the winter. And what that'll do is, you know, the rain hitting it and stuff, it'll leach all those nutrients down into the soil and help get that garden bed ready for the next spring. That works out great for like a no-till gardening method uh, like Lee Rice uses. So what he does at the end of the year is he puts down a layer of compost and then he lets it set through the winter and then he's good to go for the next gardening season. So you can use it as a soil amendment, a top dressing. The other one that some people do is making compost tea. And that's taking compost and kind of putting it into a bag and soaking it in water, you know, almost like making tea. Uh, But what you're doing is you're leaching out those nutrients and you're basically making a liquid fertilizer out of the compost. You need to be careful with that because if your compost is really fresh, uh, you run the risk of burning your plants if the compost tea mixture is too strong. Composting, it's a little bit of magic, uh, but it's an art and it's a science because we're dealing with biology. And it's one of those things that it takes a lot of practice to master. I've been gardening since I was a child and I still feel like that I haven't mastered composting. But the nice thing is you really can't mess it up. If it doesn't come out exactly right, it'll just take a little bit longer to produce compost. So my gardening wisdom for this week, it comes from a 13th century Persian poet named Rumi. And he said, The ground's generosity takes in our compost and grows beauty. Try to be more like the ground. Which I think is a great way of saying you need to kind of take, you know, the crap that people throw at you and make something good of it. (laughs) That's my uh, 2019 translation of his 13th century quote. (laughs) Uh, well, <laughs> with that, um, I'll kind of wrap up the podcast for this week. For show notes and more, check out our website at bobsmarket.com slash keep growing. We're proud to recently be featured on Radio Public's list of new seasons. And whether you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, or other platforms, be sure to give us a review. For more about Bob's Market, you can find us on social media at Bob's Market and, of course, at our website, bobsmarket.com. The music in this week's episode is by Silent Partner. Copyright 2019, Bob's Market and Greenhouses, Incorporated.